it. And I'm just waiting for notification. And we, I'm just waiting for notification. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this afternoon. We have a very uh, illustrious and great guest and brother Ghazi Muhammad. First of all, assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam, big brother, Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Kareem, I want to thank you uh, very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a conversation with us. Um, my sister Miriam says, assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Uh, please give it a green to Yes, sir. Well, brother Ghazi, um, my brother Rashad, who was living in Phoenix for quite some time, was constantly telling me about the great work that you were doing in Phoenix. And I saw uh, uh, a lot of your speeches and things. Uh, Sister Lovett says something like, Sister Lovett. Love and how, how did you first get into becoming a motivational speaker? Man, it goes back. Yeah, listen to the minister, for real. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I started in, in, in prison. Actually, I started speaking when I was in prison. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was reading everything I got my hands on and started like, like just regurgitating, you know, mixing the teachings with it, with all the things I was reading. And, you know, I found compatibility with the teachings and uh, many things that I was reading. So I was synchronizing them and putting them in a way that was, you know, I guess what many people is called unique. You know, I like to say I, I, I put the Ghazi Hamza hot sauce on it. I like okay, to add my flavor to it, you know. Yes, sir. Um, but yes, sir, I started in prison. Then when, when I came home, I started working with nonprofit organizations. And um, it, it ever been over 20 years ago, right before the Million Man March. And it just pretty much skyrocketed from there. Praise be to Allah. Uh, brother Ronald says that you're his big brother, Ghazi. Y'all go back to the Brother Rondell days. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I love that, brother. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Ronald, for using inside jokes. Okay, now my next question for you, uh, Brother Ghazi, is when did you first hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Man, I first heard the teachings, Brother Joshua, in, let me see, it's like 1983. Mm -hmm. I was a little youngster. Um, my, my my uncle was the captain of the FOI when I was young in St. Louis, Gregory Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And um, Brother Robert was the minister, Brother Wahid's brother. Uh, minister Robert was the minister, and my uncle was his captain. And um, I was a handful. I, 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 I like drove my mother crazy almost. So she would call my uncle, who was the disciplinary of the family, and he was a Muslim, and he was really in, into like helping young black men. And she would call my uncle and say, you better come get red, because if you don't, I'm going to kill this boy. Mm -hmm. And um, my uncle came and got me. I remember the first time he took me to the mosque. I was 11 years old. And um, my first visit to the mosque, they was talking about the cat, rat, and the dog, the hog. <laughs> and I remember coming home. I remember coming home, you know, on Sundays, you know, in, in our community, Sundays, you know, we typically make a big meal on Sunday, a family, family meal. So I came home from the mosque that day. You know, we was having meetings at, at that time. At, I believe it was 2 o'clock in the, in the afternoon when the mm -hmm. meeting time started. And I came home and my mother had some pork chops and some macaroni and cheese and some rice and And mm, I came mm. saying, I ain't eating that stuff. I said, they got the cat, the red, and the dog in it, you know? And mm, it, mm. it was, I stopped eating pork from that point on. But it was 1983 when I first heard the teachings. Okay, excellent. Uh, Sister Ariane, like I said, like, I mean, some like, like, Islam, Sister Ariane. My next question for you, uh, Brother Ghazi, is why did you accept the teachings? Um, I didn't readily accept it. Like, I accepted what the minister was saying. So I heard the, the, the like the local brought here, my uncle, I heard Minister Robert, but I didn't actually hear Minister Farrakhan until 1985. And uh, at that time, I, I was getting out of juvenile for my third or fourth time. I was in a drug rehabilitation center and uh, I, I just was hard headed and very rebellious. And my uncle gave me the tape, um, Power at Last Forever, the Madison Square Garden lecture of the minister in New York. And that tape just affected, I listened to it over and over and over and over mm, again, mm, you know, mm, it just mm. affected my thinking, you know, and, and I would always go back to the mosque. I didn't have no discipline. I didn't have no, I, no, no, no thought about like, you know, being moral. I just wanted to go back. I, I really loved and enjoyed what the brothers were saying, but I just didn't have the discipline. So I would go to the mosque and I may leave the mosque and man, go smoke some weed or go steal mm -hmm. a car or something. But I would call my uncle Saturday like, uh, are you going to the temple? Because I wanted to, I, I always wanted to go back and hear what they were saying. It was touching a, a part of me, you know. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. I didn't accept it. Just, just, just. I, I want to be a Muslim. I love hearing what the men. When I heard the minister, it, it was like that was done right there. Like, man, who is this dude? Okay, excellent. Praise be to Allah. And brother Ron, I'm going to ask him that question. How did you, uh, when you did accept the teachings, how did your parents feel about that? My, um, you know, my mother, she was happy because um, I was 
something else. You know, I was always getting kicked out of school. I, was, I mean, getting a house shot up. I, I was in them streets tough at, at a young age. I'm from St. Louis. So I was in them streets real tough. And uh, so she was happy that I was doing something that was positive. Um, I didn't meet my father. I had actually met the minister in person in Chicago mm. before I met my biological father. I met my biological father right after I had met the minister in the final call building. And um, when I met my father, I, it, it, it was rough because he was a Christian. And then at that time he, he was dealing with drugs. Um, and I remember a time when my father, he woke me up um, to watch a movie with him. It was late at night. He wanted me to watch Shaft, you know, them old Shaft movies. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, I'm like, Pop, you know, he was kind of drunk. You know, he was inebriated. And I, I say, Pop, I gotta get up and go to school no more. I just, I, I, when, when I met my father, I say, man, I got to live with you. My first conversation with him was I got to live with you because mom finna put me out the house and had me locked up in juvenile time 21. Mm. So, you know, he, he let me live with him, but that, it, it was a blessing because he lived right down the street from the mosque. Mm. So it was like, literally, the mosque was in East St. Louis. So I, I would walk to his house and go, like walk, walk down to the mosque. And it, it was really affecting me when I can go all the time now. I, I was really trying to change my life around. But then, you know, one time my father, he had, um, he wanted to, to wake me up to watch a movie with him. And I said, I, I got to get up and go to um, school in the morning. And his response to me was, and I quote, if I was one of them old bald head ass Muslims, you would get up and watch this movie with me. And I mm -hmm. looked at him because at the time I was going to the mosque a lot. My first job was in the Blue Seas restaurant in East St. Louis, sweeping okay. the floor and things okay. like that. First job I ever had in my life. And um, and I looked at him. So, you know, I got up, you know, I seen he was kind of drunk a little bit. I got up and watched the movie. But the next day when I came home, he had took my Quran and my tapes at a minister and he had threw them all out in the middle of the street, man, in East St. Louis. And I was heated, brother. I mean, it, it took me all the way back to that street life. And I, I actually called one of my partners in St. Louis to go get, get go, go get me a strap. I, I couldn't shoot my daddy. I was that mad. I'm like, man, I'm trying to change my life around. And here you are. And you know, I, I called my uncle because I was I, I was gonna go at because I'm like, I don't know you for real. Man. I just met you. You can't be doing me like that, bro. I don't know. We ain't cool <laughs> like that, you know. And um, but I called my uncle and he, he you know he came and, and talked to him. You know, my father knew my uncle very well. He came and talked to him and said, man, look, you know, the boy changed his life around, man. He was getting kicked out of schools and everything. Now he's trying to do something different with his life, you know? So, Beautiful. yeah, but they didn't like it. He okay. didn't like it at first, but he loved it now. Let me, let me say that now my father loved it. When he see brothers out selling the paper, he's so proud to say, my son is Gazi. You know, he, you know, he a Muslim too, you know? <laughs> but he called me many times now when he, when he in East St. Louis and the brothers out, he'd be like, you know, he called me, um, some of your brothers out here with the papers and the bean pies, you know, so, you know, he, be proud of it now. Praise be to Allah. That's an amazing story. Um, I interviewed the minister of East St. Louis um, about a few weeks ago. Who, Brother Ralph? Yes, sir. Brother yes, sir. Ralph? Oh, yeah. Yes, See, he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother Ralph. Yeah. Okay. I've been knowing him for a long time, man. Mm, mm. Okay. Um, back to you. We're going to come back to your mother, but I want to go back to you meeting the minister in the final call building. How did that transpire? Man, brother, this is a, uh, this is a heck of a story. And, and this the... Uh, I haven't even shared this story too many times. I started doing storytelling events and, and I shared this story um, at a, st a storytelling event about 16 times. So when I was 14 years old, and this is gonna be like a little tedious story here, but I'm, 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 I'm gonna give you a short version. When I was 14 years old, I was had just got put out of um, high school for my third time, and my second time, and I was just getting about a juvenile. I was in a drug rehabilitation center for snorting drugs at, 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 at a young age. And um, the, my uncle gave me the tape of the minister, Power It Lasts Forever. It affected my spirit. And at the time, my mother took me to a mental hospital. Uh, I had been seeing psychotherapy because she like, man, I beat this boy butt and he's doing the same thing tomorrow. So she thought I was just crazy. She said, this boy got to be crazy because I put it on him and he, and he just hard headed or something, you know? Mm -hmm. But she took me to mental hospitals and things like that, right? So after hearing the tape about a thousand times, I called my uncle. I say, um, where's Farrakhan at? He said, here in Chicago. I said, okay, what's, I'm 14. I said, okay, what's Chicago? He said, it's in Illinois. Now, East St. Louis is in Illinois. So that's right next to Missouri, right? He said, look, man, I was so naive, brother. I thought I can catch the local bus from St. Louis to Chicago. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I got on the bus and I caught the bus all the way to East St. Louis, far as the bus took me and they got out and I started asking people, how far is Chicago from here? They looking at me like, Chicago? Like, man, you about two, 300 miles from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I started hitchhiking, brother. I hitchhiked mm -hmm. to Chicago. Um, and it was it was something, I was walking down Highway 55, I laid on the side of the road, and it, it was raining, I fell asleep, wasn't nobody picking me up, I fell asleep, I woke up, it was a brother, an old truck driver, he, he was walking up on me, and I kind of jumped up, I had a straight razor in my pocket, 
like you had a, the barber used to use. I yes, put sir. my hand in my pocket and the brother said, hey, hey, hey. He said, man, what you doing out here? I was in the middle of nowhere. I don't know where I was at. I said, man, I'm going to Chicago. He said, for what? I said, man, my, um, I said, my family died in the fire and I got to go meet my grandma and them. They don't know it. They're in Chicago. And the brother like, well, I'm going that way, but if you got any weapons, I, I, I can't let you in my truck, man. I want you to try to hurt me. And he was an older brother, so I, I sized him up like, if he tries something, I'm just gonna deal with him physically, you know? <laughs> so I gave him the straight razor, you know? And uh, as fate would have it, as far as that brother was going, he was very pleasant, older brother, man, had grandchildren. We talked about his grandchildren and things. As far as he was gone, was right around the corner from where Moss Marion is now. And it's a, mm -hmm. on, on Stony Island, it's a hospital, Jackson Park Hospital. The brother dropped me off at the hospital and he said, you can stay in the waiting room of the hospital. He gave me $20. And it was a jewel supermarket across the street. He said, you can go in there and get you some groceries until you find your family. So I went into, in, into the hospital, went to sleep. And it was crazy. I went right in the hospital and just laid down like I had somebody in the hospital or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Got up the next morning and I walked down Stony Island and I seen brothers cleaning up outside the building, cleaning up. At that time, the Moss Marion was up on the email ward named Muhammad. So mm. they was cleaning up and I seen the word Muhammad and I say, brothers, uh, you are Muslims? He said, yeah, I'm like, man, that's just what I'm supposed to be at. So I walk up in there, it was Jumaa prayer day. That's the first time I've been to Jumaa was in Mas Marian. So I go in Mas Marian and everybody on the floor and you know, I see different ethnic groups and it was different from the temple in East St. Louis that we stood up and just turned to the East and held our hands. I see yes, they, yes, they, yes. they, 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 they were giving me a dime, they was praying and it was just strange, man. And um. After the meeting was over, I asked some brothers, I say, excuse me, brother, do y'all know Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan? And they started telling me, uh, man, they started hating on the minister in a way like, brother, you know, we not black, brother, we Bilalians. I'm, I was confused. I had never heard that talk before. Mm. And I had a black jacket on it. They say, put your hand next to your jacket. That's black. You not black. You know, we Bilalians. And, uh, you know, I didn't understand the difference. I thought all Muslims followed Farrakhan at the time. I didn't know it was yes, Sunni sir. Shiite. I didn't know none of that. So yes, I left that kind of confused. But I'm walking through Chicago and I see a truck that had Muslim newspaper on the side of it. And they go up into a building. I walk into the building. And I see a big picture of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Mother Clara. And the, the picture, the, the Christ didn't have his feds on. So he looked kind of different. I'm looking at the picture. And the sister who worked in the store, they told like bean pies and little books and little Islamic literature. And she said, brother, can I help you? I said, who is that man right there? She said, that's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I said, oh, cool. I said, it's Farrakhan here? And then she said, she, 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 with that, you know, with that group, I just left. She got the saying some more off the wall stuff too, but it was an FOI and the store buying something. Mm. And the brother said, sister, that ain't what the minister teach. He was very polite. And he got the saying what the minister, he sounded like my uncle and them. I said, oh yeah, this is what I'm looking for. I went to the parking lot. I, I waited for that brother. He came out. I said, brother, do you know Farrakhan? He said, yes, sir. He, he, he said, I said, where yet? He gave me the card, you know, 734 West 79th Street. Final card. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he gave me the card and the, um, and it's a lot more to the story, but man, I wound up living with some little gang bangers, smoking weed, doing all kind of crazy stuff. But but eventually made my way up to the final car building. And actually, it was during the time of uh, when the minister was doing the How to Give Birth to a God series. Okay. So on okay. One of them series, on one of them series, a lot of believers always call me. They say, "Brother, is that you in the audience? You know how the camera scan the audience?" Yes, sir. I'm yes, like sir. a little video dude, look young, and you know, and I'm right there in the final car building, like this to the minister, like man, this is powerful, you know, and. Um, um, while I was up there that day, you know, um, while I was up there that day, uh, or, or during the time I was up there, I was in the back of the final car building reading the names of the brothers and sisters on the wall. And uh, and, and it, I, behind me, they said, Salam Alaikum. So I turned around, I said, well, I said, damn, Mr. Minister. I, said, oh. I was like blown away. Like it was the minister and I think brother Musafir, he was wallet at the time and some, some other brothers with him. And, you know, I'm looking I'm like, man, it's the minister talking to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was a lot more that, 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 that to that, man. I had a chance to meet Sister Abe at that time. And, you know, many other the brothers who was around, Brother Mohan, Brother Saber, and Brother, man, a lot of brothers that I met at that time. Abdullah Yassin, and, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Praise be to a lot. And thank you for your uh, testimony, sir, and your transparency. Brother Robert Muhammad is checking in, saying from New Orleans, some like him, Ramadan Mubarak, Brother Robert. But Robert, please inbox me. Um, my sister's name says Peace Family, uh, Starians at OMG, everybody's saying excellent teaching, everybody's liking it. Cool. My next question is, uh, Brother Ronald at, wants to know, could you give your testimony about your mother meeting the minister? Oh, yes. Yeah. So my mother, man, she, uh, my mother, she was, uh, so my mother's from the streets. You know, my mother, she had, um, 
She had her first child at 14. Uh, yeah, 14. She had my twin brother and I at 16. By the time she was 20, she had five children and had been married twice. So she dropped out of school at an early age. But she's from the streets. You know, when I say streets, pistols, Cadillac, gold teeth. That's my mother. You know, straight up. And so she she didn't have a lot of formal education, but this woman had a PhD in streetology. She knew how to hustle and make money. And all the ballers liked her because she was pretty, plus she knew how to make that money, you know? And uh, so I grew up being influenced by that and later on being influenced by the teachings. So my mother, um, when I came home from prison, well, when I was locked up, so, so I, I got registered in 88 at 16 and I wound up going to prison a few months later because I was still buck wild. I'm still shooting and all kind of stuff. You know, I wound up going to prison a few months later as a young FOI. And, um, but that was all in Allah's plan. It was beautiful for me, the, the way it turned out in the long run. And, um, but when I got locked up, you know, my mother, when I grew up, my mother, you know, she was there like for everybody. You know, she was like that go-to person in the community. So I grew up seeing my mother being that strong person that people relied on. But when I got locked up, my mother wasn't that for me, you know, like, you know, call or collect. She didn't answer the calls. I wrote it. She didn't write letters back, nothing like that. So I developed a lot of bitterness towards my mother. And um, I remember when, um, so when I came home, I had like hatred for real. Like I, I, I was numb emotionally. I, I didn't care nothing about nobody on the outside world because I was in a situation. I was in maximum security prison. I was young. And uh, luckily the, the, the teachers put me in a different category by, by a lot of grace. But, um, it, but, but I seen a lot of horrific things in that. And, uh, you know, you need your mother, you, you know, you want somebody to, to write you back and let you know they love you. And I didn't really have that. So I grew completely numb. So when I came home and, um, you know, I shared this story recently at, at a storytelling event. But when I came home, I was bitter. I had a lot of hatred towards my mother. And the minister was talking about atonement. And um, I had went to my mother after I heard the minister talk about atonement. And I went to my mother and, you know, I, I told her how I felt, you know, I told, told her I hated it and stuff like that. And, you know, she looked at me and her response to me, brother, what, what blew my mind because my mother, she was a hustler turned drug addict. So before she died, she struggled with crack addiction, right? For many years. And um, when I got locked up, she, she my, my mother told me this when I told her how I felt. And we're like, I said, mama, you weren't enough for me. I really needed you. And I, I wanted to get this up off of me because the men to say a tone, go to the person, point the wrong guy and get that up off of you so y'all can start mending y'all relationship. So when I go to my mother and say that, you know, my mother with tears in her eyes, she looked at me. She say, son, when you got locked up, there was absolutely nothing I can do for you. You was going to prison. No street credibility, no money, the lawyer, well, nothing. You, you was going to prison, well, nothing I can do. And she say, because I wasn't the most spiritual person, I wasn't religious, I didn't turn to God. She say, I started smoking crack to escape the pain of what my son was about to go through. Cause I didn't know if he was gonna live or die in that place. So here I am thinking that, you know, you just abandoned me. You ain't care nothing about me. You just said to hell with him. And you telling me that one of the contributing factors of you becoming a drug addict was to escape the pain of what my little delinquent behavior put my, put my own self in. You know what I'm saying? And man, I, I was affected deeply by that. So me and my mother, we atoned and we got tight, right? So my mother, she was struggling with the, with the addiction. She, she was dealing with cancer and this woman was resilient. She was on hospice like two, three times. So one time I, I had moved to Arizona, moved my family to Arizona. And um, my sister called me one time and say, they gave mom six weeks to live. I say, man, I, I got my ex-wife and my children. We got in the van, we hit hit the road. We didn't even have the money to go to St. Louis, but I was beating F for a while on the highway to give me gas money and stuff like that. I just want, I didn't want her to die, you know, before I got down there, you know? And um, so some of praise be a lot for the FOI, you know, I'm meeting brothers on, on, literally on the highway, on the way. And um, when we get down there, my mother was real little. She was small. And um, I said, um, they said she had six weeks to live. And so I started asking her questions, you know, I said, mama, do you have any regrets in life? Is there anything that, that you want to do before you die? Or was there anything, that, 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 any plans you had to accomplish that you never accomplished? And she looked at me, she real weak. She said, nah, son, I don't really have no regrets. She said, well, it's one thing I want to do before I die. I said, what? She said, I want to meet Louis Farrakhan. Mm. I said, you want to meet the minister? And then I was blown away. I, I, I said, mom, why you want to meet the minister? She said, because son, you was my worst child. You was worse than all my children combined. And she said, I want to, and she said, now you turn out to be my best. And I want to meet the man that changed your life around. And man, that touched me. I said, wow. And then my mother said this. She said, if I die before I get to meet him, if he can stand over my grave, and then she said, as I lost my witness, my mother said this to me. She said, oh, if I can get close to him and touch the hem of his garment. Mm -hmm. This is my mother saying to me, right? So I thought she was going to die in six weeks, but she didn't. This woman was strong. She kept bouncing out of hospice. And she lived. And about a year or so later, 
my, my twin brother hustling out of the house and got the house kicked in and police melting, messing with her and she was dealing with cancer. So I called, I said, mama, won't you, and she had went through the chemo, the radiation and all that. And she was getting sicker and sicker. And I said, mama, won't you come up here to see Dr. Patina, you know, the naturopathic doctor, brother Jabril's wife. I said, won't you come to Dr. Patina? You know, maybe she can do something for you since, you know, they, they've exhausted their means. In, in the medical world, they pretty much say, well, nothing they can do but keep you medicated, you know, ease your pain. And she was always sick. So it was on the New Year's and I, I flew my mother out here. She woke up in St. Louis, went to sleep in Arizona. Her first time ever on the plane. Now I flew to Arizona and, um, you know, we immediately took her to Dr. Patina to, 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 to see what the naturopathic route can do for her. And um, I was out at that time, I was driving taxis. You know, I was a taxi driver and I was out like one o'clock in the morning working. You know, I was grinding out, I'm not getting that money. And my ex-wife called me and she said, mom, I'm sick. Like she's in a lot of pain. I said, well, call the paramedics, I'm on my way home. So I go, go to the hospital, I, mean, I go home. When I get there, paramedics pulling my mother up out the house. And um, I say, man, so we going to the hospital and in the hospital here in Arizona, this a year and about a year and a half later, my mother, she was, she said this, I forgot about the conversation we had, brother. Man, my mother in the hospital, she say, damn, I thought I was gonna meet, get, get a chance to meet Farrakhan before I died. I say, oh, and brother, the minister had just came into the city two days prior to that. I say, man, I gotta get mom to see the minister. And you know, this was a year and a half later. I say, oh, so I, Got the car in the rock. I, I called Brother Melvin with the um, team and I, I told him the story, told him what my mother said by touching him of his garment. And you know, because she told me, I don't think I'm gonna make it this time. I, you know, I think I'm gonna die, right? And um, Brother Melvin, after he heard the story, he said, Brother, I'm gonna give you Joshua Farrakhan number. And he said, Man, call Joshua and um, tell Josh this story. And I called Brother Josh, uh, Brother Joshua, and uh, he was, uh, at the time he had left the city, I believe, went to like some kind of war show, but he said, I'll be back tomorrow. But he heard the story. He said, brother, write a letter and take that over to the National House and you get that letter to Sister Kim. I'm going to call over there and tell him you're coming. You're going to bring the letter to Sister Kim. This is on a Friday. This was Thursday. I wrote the letter and took it over there Friday. On Saturday morning, about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from a 773 every code, time, right? Sister's like, Salam alaikum, this is Sister Kim, the minister, the executive secretary. I'm like, damn. <laughs> and she said, the minister read the letter and... Uh, you know, he wanted to, you know, um, come see your mother. What's your address? And the minister was going to come to my home. I said, man, I'm thinking like the minister's going to come to my house. Like, I was blown away. So my mother, I had drove her past the national house and she said, oh, this is beautiful. And she seen the crescent of star, you know, here in Phoenix and everything. And the, the sign that say, you know, um, Elijah Muhammad, historic district. She seen yes, that. So she wanted to come into the house. I said, well, I didn't want to inconvenience the minister too much. I said, well, we can come over there. And I heard the minister in the background asking like, can she walk? Is she all right to walk? I said, yes, ma'am, you know, she had real weak, but she can walk. So the minister said, okay, come on come tomorrow at, at, at 12, you know, 12, 30 after the mile. My mother, my ex and I, man, we went to, to the national house. It was phenomenal, man. We pulled up in there and the uh, mother Khadija come down and she gave my mother a kiss and hugged her and say, sister, we love you and we praying for you. And uh, the minister and, and brother Joshua walked in and man, it was just a beautiful thing. The minister prayed with my mother, brother, and talk to her. And I'm gonna tell you something about my mother. That was the only time my mother was ever in a garment. My ex-wife, MGC, right? Mm. And my mother said this, and no, she from the streets. She told my ex, she said, look, can I have one of them beautiful Muslim outfits y'all be wearing? Cause I don't want to go meet Farrakhan any kind of way. I want to look like a black queen when I meet the minister. Mm -hmm. That's what my mother said. So that's the first and only time she was garbed up, you know? Now we go there and, and, and meet the minister. He prayed for her, talked to her for about 45 minutes, an hour, man, very beautiful. You know, it, it very heartfelt. And when we left, the minister walked out and watched us leave and just smiled. And I looked at him, I said, man, I love you, man. Like, man, it, 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 and, and the minister took pictures, you know. He, he wanted to take pictures. He told John, he said, take some pictures. And he, he had a picture. He said, I want to take pictures just like this. He was kissing my mother on the cheek. Mm. And, uh, you know, I got that picture blown up in, in, in my house. He was kissing my mother on the cheek. And uh, Josh took that picture. And I said, you mad? we take pictures like with our phone. And we took the pictures and things. So. Later on that night, um, my ex had put a, a, a post up on, on social media with the meeting with the minister. And um, so I had a lot of believers calling me from across the country. Like, Man, you know, how you, how you with the minister? How you with the minister? But to me, they sound like I was with a rock star, to be honest. It, it mm -hmm. was like he was an entertainer, like he was Michael Jackson or something. So mm -hmm. I didn't like the response. And I wasn't going to put the picture up because in my mind, this man is the third most powerful in the universe. Wow, and he meet with kings and rulers. And he took time out to meet my mother who was struggling with a, with crack addiction 
and an old ex thug convict little brother. He took time out his busy schedule to meet us. That wasn't by no no celebrity, no no no. I ain't, I ain't want to hear none of that. So I called my ex. I said, take that picture off social media right now. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I didn't want to put that up because I ain't like what people were saying to me because it was more sacred to me that the minister took time out his schedule to see us like that. To me, we was like, I ain't gonna say we we nobody, but man, we you know we like man, we, we at the bottom of the barrel, and you know this man, the man of God, he took time out for us, right? And um, my mother, she went back to St. Louis. Man, my mother was happy. She called me. She said, Red, that's my nickname. They called me Red. She said, Red, I went to these cancer doctors. She said, and my mother, she didn't have a strong vocabulary. She would say readmission. She said, Red, they say my cancer went in readmission. You know, she said they can't find nothing. She had a tumor on her brain, brother. The tumor was gone and everything. So it was at that point, I said, man, can't nobody tell me nothing about this man here. This man, Jesus. I said, she met with Jesus. And my mother lived an additional eight, nine years, she, she just died in 2017, that was like 2009. So she lived uh, an extra nine years and it wasn't the cancer that took her out. She struggled with that addiction to her death. That, that's pretty much what he wrote in her life, but it wasn't the cancer though. She was healed, brother, and I watched it with my own eyes. And when she it left her, she was riding bikes with my children. She was riding down the sliding board, walking to the park. And when she went back to St. Louis, my family like, man, what the hell happened to your mama? Like, well, how, how she do this? I, and my mom like, she met with the man of God. Allah Akbar. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. That's a powerful uh, uh, story and testimony. Thank you very much for your uh, transparency and your great testimony. Thank you all for watching. My sister Naima says, all praise to Allah. But Elijah Muhammad says he remembers all praise to Allah. Um, sister Miriam, uh, my sister Mimi, that's so beautiful. Sister Ariane, all praise to Allah. Beautiful, beautiful. Brother Ronald finally um, asked a good question. Okay, um, my next question for you is, how did you, how was it like when you were in prison? Man, it was something. I was, um, you know, I had actually, the first time I wrote a letter to the minister was in 1990. When I went to prison, I, I was a young FOI. And when I went, most of the people who was in there, who was in, in the Islam, they was either up under the Imam Wadley Muhammad or they was more signs up under Noble Jew Ali. So it was very few up under the minister because I guess we had a little bit more discipline to begin be, become criminals at that time, you know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, and, 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 and in Missouri, it wasn't a strong NOI presence when I got locked up. Um, mm -hmm. So most of most of the brothers was in the Balalian community. But so they started giving me books talking about the Master of Muhammad. And I seen these pictures of some dude talking about his drug dealer and you know uh, his name Wallace died and you know he came, he was a part of the Communist Party and I had never heard nothing like that before. So I didn't yes, know sir. how to respond to none of that. I had nothing in my mind to respond to what they were saying about the savior. So I wrote a letter to the minister in 1990. I went to the final call and, and got the address of the final call um, and wrote a letter to the minister say, you know, I, I need help understanding Master Brown Muhammad because I, I didn't know how to defend that. Mm. And the minister actually wrote me a letter back in prison and mm. he sent me mm. two lectures. He sent me, Who is God? 1990 yeah. Savior's Day. Yeah, and he yeah. sent me a lecture called, Why We Believe Allah Came in the Person of Master Farah Muhammad. And it was that lecture right there the minister talking about the Arabic word Gaib, that the, the Quran translated as unseen. That was the beginning of my study of Arabic language, but I had enough juice off them taste right there. It was on, brother. I started going, I, I want to battle all these cats now. I'm going to the Black Nazis, the revolutionaries, the Orthodox. I'm like, let's, let, 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 let's get it on. I was battling with them and I was reading all this material. But during that time, man, prison was rough. I, I spent, because I, I became so rebellious, they shipped me around six different prisons. I spent a total of 48 months in solitary confinement um, mm -hmm. during the time I was down. So I went from 16 to 24. I got out when I was 24 years old. And um, it, it, it was rough, man. And it, it was, man, they, they kept locking me down. And I went through the mace, the tear gas, the billy clothes. I, I went through all that in prison. I was very young and rebellious and um, very outspoken. And you know, I, I was doing crazy stuff too, calling the warden's devil. And I mean, I was doing all kinds of stuff, you know, just firing, like being unafraid. And, um, but I, I was able to, since I did so much time in solitary confinement, I was able to read and read and read. And, you know, I started re really, I learned how to read and write Arabic. And, you know, um, I, I thank a lot of the brothers up under the email that taught me how to make my salas in Arabic. And mm -hmm. it, it, I, I started learning about the Hadith and the Sunnah and the Sharia yes, and Fiqh. Yes, I started yes, reading all that. And I saw, I didn't see no conflict with what Amba Laj Muhammad taught. It was like, oh, this bear witness to what Amba Laj Muhammad yes, taught to me. Okay, praise God, beautiful. Now, can you please, with with going to jail and being in prison and um, those 48, you said 48 months, solitary confinement, how did you not go crazy? Man, that's, you know, that's something deep. You know, I, I did a, um, 
a um, webinar when COVID-19 first came out. You know, I'm, I'm a coach now. I do life coaching, like empowerment coaching. Okay, and one of my clients asked him, he said, man, um, Brother Ghazi, I sure would like to know how you survived that time in, 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 in solitary confinement because I've been in the house five days and I'm going crazy. I'm losing my mind. So the, <laughs> how, how did you do it? It was only by the grace of Allah, but I was fasting. I had to, you know, when you're in the hole, they give you some books. You know, you, it can't be hardback. So if you got a Quran, you got like cut, you got to um, tear the cover off. Or they ain't giving it to you. You got to be soft back. Or if it's a hard back, you got to tear the cover off because it can be used as a weapon, you know. Mm. Um, so I told you know, told, told the cover off my Quran and, you know, uh, got my Quran in there. I was reading the Quran and Bible and reading a lot of books. And a uh, brother got me a map, a, a world map. And I would get the newspaper and I would just study everywhere that, that was on that map. If I seen something in the news, whatever country, in Europe, Africa, Asia, I would find it on the map. And so I can like be familiar with geography, you know, since we was taught that, you know, the square this thing, I want to know where everything was at, you know? Yes, sir. And, um, but I did a lot of praying. It was only by the grace of God. I did a lot of praying um, and um, reading and studying. And, and, and reading for me became like, a, um, like my drug of choice. It, it was my way of escape. Like my mother used drug, you know, reading. It, it, it took my mind somewhere else. I was reading. I wasn't. I was in the hole, but hell, I, I lived in Africa, Asia, the Central and South America, the Middle East. I was all over the planet, you know, in my mind, you know, because I was reading all these books, and I, and I was just always somewhere else. But but prayer, prayer. I did a lot of fasting, a lot of praying while I was in solitary. Beautiful. Praise be to Allah. Thank you all for seeing to watch people's podcast. Um, my next question is. Hold on one second. I want to make sure I give. I see my sponsors. Uh, my, I want to make sure my brother Rashad, who made sure I, we got the uh, interview. Thank you, Rashad, for being the plug for Brother Ghazi. Uh, Street Premier. Him and Brother Jamal have a video production company. They're working on you know have a uh, 4K drone and they are working on videos and movies. So thank them for their sponsorship. My sister Miriam, her children's book ABC I Love Me and Coloring Book, both of which are on Amazon. My second uh, book which is a children's book. Cleopatra is on Amazon. Thank you all very much for your support. I want to make sure that I thank, for one second, my sister, Naima Mohammed, Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC, which is on Instagram. She teaches children how to do ballet. Um, Supreme Men's Clothing in St. Louis, Missouri, 10835 West Florissant Avenue. Um, this is in St. Louis, 314-528-555 is the number. Brother Rondo in Phoenix, BMW Entertainment, they do event planning. Make sure you all reach out to them. And thank you all very much for your sponsorship. Sister Tia Binos Muhammad, I want to make sure that I give them a shout out. They have flashcards for young Black children about how to be Black millionaires, economic development. These are just great flashcards. Make sure everybody support that. Um, you can reach out to her on Facebook. Also, this, uh, I want to make sure. Akira's Cafe in Chicago, akiras.com, 773 Eight six zero one six nine six, Brother Aaron in Chicago. They will send you coffee anywhere in the country. Thank you very much, Brother Aaron. Hollytexture.com, natural hair products and hair uh, coloring, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Make sure we support them. Supreme Team Insurance, Todd X McGraw, 803-521-2787. Saladin Porter, Brother David Adams. Thank you all very much for your support. Brother Eric, who is also in Phoenix. PPCnaturesv.com, Black-owned HIV and HSV immunotherapy. Um, Sister Shelly Muhammad, Las Vegas, Nevada, Khalid Boutique, thank you very much. And Supreme Express, the X Factor in, transporta in Transportation and Logistics in Houston, Texas, Brother Chant um, Chantil X Trucking Company. Um, they specialize in refrigeration and freight. Thank you all very much for your sponsorships. And if you all would like to sponsor uh, an episode so I can promote your business, you can sponsor at the dollar sign, the People's Podcast. And thank you very much. Okay, brother Gazi, back to you. Because you came from such a strong, uh, like a you know strong city, East St. Louis, then you were in prison, then you were in, then you leave, and you know, have you ever faced a time of fear? And if so, how did you overcome that fear? Man, <clears throat> um, fear. I'm trying to think, but <laughs> yes, sir. You yes, know, sir. I don't know. You know, I came up so reckless. You know, I used to think. My, my mother used to tell me when I was younger that you're going to be dead or in prison by the time you're 16, you know, and, and, and she was right, you know, hopefully, thank, thank for a lot. I, I didn't get killed out there, but I did go to prison. And um, I think I was so reckless. I just didn't care nothing about living, you know, and, mm. and what I realized in studying my own life, I realized the plight of a, a lot of our young, young brothers 
And it's not that um, I wanted to see what was on the other side. And it wasn't that, that I wasn't afraid to die, nothing like that. But at that time, my life was such a hell. Whatever was on the other side had to be better than this. So mm -hmm. I didn't mind giving this up. It ain't that I wanted to go see that. I just didn't mind giving this up. It was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I see murder, there's violence and drug addicts and all that. So this can't be life, you know? And, yes, and I didn't mind giving that up right there, you know? Um, but fear, I, I I don't know, like like fear like being scared because I, I, I was never afraid to die. I think that's the ultimate fear. People say motive public speaking is, is the number one fear. <laughs> and uh, I never had a problem with that, man. You give me a mic, it's on. It, yes, I, sir, I go yes, and my thing. But I, I don't know, um, just, just, well, I would say this growing. Growing has been something on, on my mind, like getting outside my comfort zone. So I was used, when I came into Arizona, I was so used to East St. Louis, St. Louis, the predominantly black city. So I was used to talking and working with the young people in the black perspective. When I came here, it's a lot of Latinos and Caucasians. So being able to, to go into them circles, I, I, I was a little, little, little trepidation, like, man, what am I gonna say to them? I don't know how to say to them people. I, I can talk to Junebug and Pookie and Pee Wee and them. I, I talk to them cats all day long, but to talk to other people, other ethnic groups, that was challenging. You know, I wouldn't say fear, but but it was definitely challenging to me. But but I faced it by just thinking of words that a minister. You know, when I faced them challenging situations, I reflect on the words that a minister and the Ambalaj Muhammad, and I just move on and call on Allah. Praise be to Allah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sister Love It. Uh, my next question is, <clears throat> oh, the May May March. Were you? Uh, how was it leading up to the May May March, and how did that impact you personally? Man, I got out 48 months, 48 days for the Million Man March, right? Yes, and I remember my first parole officer was a brother named Jeremiah Grimes. And when I went to his office, he had a stack, man, he had a stack of photos this big on all the stuff I was supposed to say it over the years, the radical, militant, anti-government stuff, right? And so when I, when I met him, he said this, he said, look, um, I'm, I'm new, I'm a new parole officer. He said the head of probation and parole didn't feel it was appropriate for a white parole officer to take your case. The mm. other black parole officer, they didn't want your case. I'm mm. trying to build my case load up, so I didn't mind getting your case, you know? <laughs> and so he was looking through the, he was looking through the file. He, he got the quotes and stuff that I supposed to have said. He said, you say that? I said, man, I don't know about I, I probably, I don't know, it was some radicals. I don't know if I said that stuff or not. Mm. But I asked him, I said, look, you know, you know I'm a Muslim, I want to go to the Million Man March. And he said, well, you know, you can't go, because you can't cross state lines when you're on parole. I said, yeah, all right. And um, that's how it was. I went to the cabin at the time in St. Louis. It was Brother Jerry. He passed away. Um, Brother Jerry, may Allah be pleased with him. But he was a captain of the FOI. And I, and I went to him and, you know, he came to me quoting the Christ, like, we well, you know the Muhammad said, obey the laws of the land. And I looked at him the same way I looked at the parole officer. Yeah, all right. You know, and it was like that, like, all right, yeah. And because in my mind, I'm like, man, it's the Million Man March, you know? And I remember I seen him up in DC. You know, we wound up going to Million Man March. And I seen the cabin and say, brother, what you doing up here? I said, Brother Cabin, they come give me out of one million brothers. I deserve to go back and we're going to tell this man. He looking at me like, man, what I got on my hands. I fresh out them joints and yes, man, the million man march, brother, impacted me big time. I seen that and just that trip up there was, man, it was so beautiful to me. I seen brothers from all over and, you know, we stopping them to the towns and at the gas station, they'd be all them brothers and everybody knew we was heading to DC and it was like, we, it was a, like a convoy about a thousand cars and we looked out for each other. You know, we just met and it was embracing and what the minister said and that whole experience, brother, it affected me deeply, brother. Like it changed my whole, I'm like, oh man, I got to do something for this nation here. And, and it kind of solidified, you know, like don't go back to the to left field, you know, try to stay on the right path. You know, it was the million man wants to concretize that in my mind when I seen that and that, that it was a beautiful thing. I'm glad, but when I came back, the PO, they said, probably looking for me. At my auntie's house, they was lying for me, say he had work and he working the extra shift and stuff like that. And by the grace of Allah, they didn't lock me up. I didn't get no parole violation and nothing. But they did come look for me a couple of times. And I wasn't standing what they was talking about. I'm like, man, I'm going to the Million Man March. I tripping. I wasn't even standing what the camera was talking about. I, I probably should have, but I just wasn't. I'm like, man, it's the Million Man March. I tripping. Okay. Okay, beautiful. What do you do for fun, brother guys? Man, for fun, like, you know, I, I got, well, I got a lot of babies. <laughs> so, I, you know, I did with my children. And like yesterday, I had a good time with my children and grandchildren. Uh, I have, when I came, I, I got uh, 10 children. Mm. So I came out producing. I like tell people like, I had to make up a lost time you know, when I was gone, you know. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, that, you know, how a lot works. When I came home, I had a baby every year for the first four years. And 
only one since I was married to. One of them I wasn't married to. I was fornicating, mm-hmm. right? And, um, and I had a baby every year for the first four years. But as a lot would have it, he blessed me to get custody. I don't know how that happened to this day, but I got custody of all four of them. So I was yeah. a single father for like six years. I was doing the cooking and the cleaning and man, the, the daycare and the, the, the doctor visits, the sick, the sick days. And uh, I developed so much respect for single mothers during that time I had my children. Man, I developed so much respect for them. And I believe, I, I, I say this, I believe that Allah blessed me with my children to reawaken in me, to quicken in me that human side, that emotional side, that prison robbed for me. Because I had to be concerned with somebody other than myself. I had to love and comfort and, and, and embrace some, you know, it, it wasn't me against the world. You know, I couldn't have that mentality because I had four little ones and it was just me and them. You know, it was just me and them. My family was such in dis- disarray. I wouldn't take them, I wouldn't let them spend that over any anybody's house because you know, tell them be some shooting, the police kick in. So it, it was just me and them for the most part, you know. And uh, so I spent a lot of time with my children. Um, right now, I love to read. You know, I, I was remarried a, a year ago. So, you know, my wife and I, we love to travel and, you know, we go all over the place and, you know, but reading, I, I, reading is my number one, you know, even from them camps, I still love to read. That's my number one pastime is learning and reading and teaching, you know. Okay, beautiful. Uh, my sister Naima says, teach, is the area answer as well. So the love, it says, all praises to a lot. And okay, well, Brother Ghazi, my next question is, speaking of, you know, your grandchildren, how has being a grandfather, how did that impact you? Man, big time. I, you know, I, I was just like yesterday was my um, grandson's first birthday. You know, mm. so you know my son and, and my son, he, he's a million man march baby. I call him the million man march baby because mm. he was born in July twenty first. So that's nine months after the million man march. So I came up with the million man march fired up in more than one way. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> and you know he came back and you know at that time his mother was my girlfriend. I fresh out the joint. He, you know, she's my girlfriend. And but we wound up getting married though. And um, and he was born um, Kofani, so his, his son. It was his birthday yesterday, so yeah. I, I remember. You know, since him and his wife, they they live in California and Seattle, so they move around. So I wasn't around them as much. But but my daughter, who just had a baby recently, she's here back in Phoenix with me. So mm-hmm. I'm able to be around my granddaughter every day, and it's just man, it's it's the life of my world. I look at it, and I remember um, it's a brother here, Minister Joel, Minister Joel. He's a, a, a pioneer brother here, very very beautiful brother. And we was in the mosque one day and I seen him and it was like five generations, like his son and they son and they son. Mm-hmm. I remember looking at that like, man, that's beautiful. Like, man, you get to see your great, great grandchildren. I, I just, I, it, that was beautiful to me. And they, they all was in the mosque and, you know, they all love their grandfather, their great grandfather. And, you know, um, so it's been a game changer for me, man, for real. It, it, it's, it's taking me vibrationally to another level, you know, and, and, and really make me think of, um, really commit myself to do something that are gonna affect generations to come. It took my mind, I was already out of that, but it really took my mind out of that idea, just live for yourself, have fun right now, enjoy your own life. No, oh, man, I wanna do something that's gonna affect my great, 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 great grandchildren. And to me, that's a part of that Abraham prayer when the Muslims say, make Muhammad successful like you made Abraham successful. Yes, but one of the things that Abraham did, his blessings affect generations to come. He dead and gone, but man, we, we the recipients of his blessing. So if I want to be successful like that, then I want to try to do something like Abraham to affect my great, 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 great. I'll be dead and gone, but they'd be like, man, y'all G-Paw laid that down like that. You yes, know? sir. Praise be to Allah. Okay, what advice would you give to future fathers? Man, to be a part of your um, children's life more than just financially, you know? And, um, you know, with me, some of, the, some of the hard lessons I learned as a father was, so I was rough, you know, I come up in the streets. So I remember when my sons was younger, when I had custody, I had three sons and, and my daughter and I was rough on my boys. I man, you know, hell man, they got hurt, they arm could be falling off. And I'd be like, boy, man up, boy, we soldiers. You know what I mean? Running, we crying. You know, I, I, I didn't permit them to cry because to me that was soft. You know what I mean? Crying, you know, to take it, you know. If somebody fights you, they're handling your business. And um, as I began to grow older and, and, and more mature as being a father, I realized something that a mistake that I was making. I was trying to prepare my children for a world that wasn't their world. Mm-hmm. I was trying to prepare them to live in a crack infested, drug infested, gun slanging environment without their father, but that wasn't their world though. So they grew up around their father. They grew up being confident and being loved. And so I tried to prepare them for that. And, and I, I made a mistake doing that, you know? So my, my son and I, we had to do some atonement. They like, Pop, you were rough. Like, you know, they like, man, my dad, you know how you mean? And, you, you know, you, in your heart, in your mind, you think you're doing what's right. 
But I had to learn, you know, one of my sons was in the art. My son, Rachman, uh, he was in the drawing the art. I'm like, you color, you go box or something. You go out here, what are you doing color for? You know, but he's an excellent artist, man. He's a beautiful artist. And I had to learn to respect the gifts that God gave all of my children. So like to respect their gifts and try to cultivate them where they are and not try to prepare them. Don't, don't use your world to judge them. You know what I'm saying? I use my experience to judge how they should be. Y'all should come up rough and tough because I was forced to come up like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I would have came up with my daddy. He hugged me and say, I love your son and things like that, you know, but unfortunately I didn't until I was 14. And it took many years after that for him to say that. Now me and my pop, you know, we got a real good relationship now, you know, but I would say, you know, um, love them and beyond the material, you know, be a part of them and don't try to direct, you know, I, I micromanage where you think they should go. Let them evolve, you know, just give them the teachers and, you know, give them good guidance and let them evolve. And um, that'd be my advice to fathers. Praise be to Allah. Brother Elijah said, wisdom. Sister Naima said, yes, sir. All praise be to Allah. Sister Ariane says, yes, teach. What advice would you give to future husbands? Oh, man. I've been married several times, too, brother. <laughs> but I would say this right here. You know, I, you know I, I, I'm always studying myself and I don't look at the faults of nobody else. You know, I've been married a couple of times. And uh, my last uh, marriage, I was married 14 years. And, you know, uh, she and I met in the mosque. So we good friends to this day. Uh, we have uh, four children together. Um, and I remember a time when I was such a gun ho type brother. Like, I, I was always, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I had Harlem companies, a security company, I had a technology company. I was always trying to do something, you know, to make money. And I was always in the community, always speaking and working with the young people. So I, I was a man on a mission, you know. And um, so I remember a time when, um, when it really hit me that, that it was straight dissatisfaction in, in, in the marriage when uh, she wasn't happy. And I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm paying the bills. We got a house, I'm, I'm, take, I'm paying all the bills. I'm, I'm taking care of things. I'm not the promiscuous type. I ain't in the streets. I ain't drinking, I ain't smoking. I come home every night, I, I take care of my children. And I'm thinking like, that's, that's enough. I mean, that should be sufficient. But what I didn't realize is that just as much as the woman is to be, I help me, we are to be, they help me as well. You know, we are to help them accomplish and fulfill the duty and the purpose that God had for their life. And I couldn't see that at first. I, it was all about just me and what I wanted to do. So when she was complaining, I'm thinking like, I thought she was happy helping me. Yeah, I'm, you see, we're doing good work. We're doing the work of the God. I'm thinking you're happy with that. And she's like, nah, you know, I like to do, I, I say, well, well, what you want to do? She said, well, I like to get into my music. You know, she's a beautiful and wonderful musician. She write music, she, you know, make music. And I always been a big fan of hers. And, so at that time, I, you know, I started getting in the studios and things like that, trying to help her get her music out there because uh, she's very talented in the musical world. Um, but at that time, we had grown. The damage was so deep. We had grown, you know, I'd say it was 9,000 miles, man. It was too far for me to swim back, unfortunately, yeah. you know. And, yeah. um, you know, we tried it. But, but I look back on it now, and I don't, it, it, it was other issues that, that we, that, that, that stem, it, it produced other issues. But uh, when I look back on it, I just look at myself. I don't look at nobody else. I ain't, I ain't got nothing to say about it. But on me, on my part, I think I overlooked that. I think I overlooked the idea that I'm to be that, that she was born with a purpose too. Damn I mean, it! It ain't just about you and your purpose. That she got a purpose too, and that purpose might not have nothing to do with you. You know, so you can also help them fulfill their purpose. And they, be, other than that, they won't be completely happy. They ain't gonna be completely happy unless that's a part of their purpose, unless their purpose is to help you. But if they got any other gifts and skills and talent that they wanna do, man, encourage that, back that, support that, just as much as you want them to support you. Beautiful, okay, praise be to Allah, yes sir. My next question is, what has been your greatest trial and how have you overcome that? My greatest trial, man, you got some good questions, bro. <laughs> I love you, bro. <laughs> man, my greatest trial. Um, Probably my greatest trial, uh, you know, probably my, my, my greatest trial, honest, is um, going through a lot of the, the, the struggles in the, in the house, you know, in, inside the mosque, you know, um, you, know I, I, you know, I had my share of, of conflict, you know, with, with laborers and, and everything over the years. People that know me, they, you know, they know. And, um, I, and I think, you know, I've seen so many brothers when they experience that kind of conflict inside the house, too many people have grown so bitter and I've seen people actually judge the minister and all kind of stuff. I don't want to do none of that, man. So, you know, it, 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 it was rough. You know, and I've been through almost coming to fist of cuffs. And, you know, it, it'd be easy to go back to that street, you know, and, you know, brothers, you know, they, they, they got ranked, but 
It's like, man, come on, brother. You better, man, you better watch who you're talking to, bro. Like, you know, it's easy to go back to that. The about the little red days. Get like, man, I'll smash you, brother. And that both, you know, but, but, but you don't want to go there because, you know, we brothers and it's the fruit and we love each other. But sometimes we talk crazy to each other, unfortunately. Yes, sir. You know? yes, sir. Um, and some of it is just do because of immaturity. So I would say, you know, one of my greatest trials was not, not growing better toward the, 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 the nation and the market. And I never did. You know, I, I mean, I, I always, and, and, and for me, to, it forced me to, that reality forced me to accept, like go into this community more and start doing more community work. It just yeah. pushed me into the wider fields, into the big fields. And um, I just love it. So I just take what I learned inside the house. And I, I do what the Quran say, I reverence their womb. So when the Quran say reverence the womb, the boys, we think it's just talking about our mother. But I'll take it as it's talking about any womb that helps shape, mold, and fashion you. And for me, the greatest womb for me, with, ain't no doubt, is, is the mosque. That's the greatest womb that shaped and mold me. So I got to respect it. You know, um, I got to reverence it. And, and, and just like you do with your mother, you know, you come back and you, you go you go to mama house and get you a good meal. And, you know, but I don't want to live with mama. To be honest, <laughs> I, I just don't want to live with mama right now. You know, I'm going to go back. I'm going to respect it. I'm going to honor her to the day I die, you know. And uh, I'm going to love her cooking. You know, can anybody outcook mama? You know, can anybody outcook mama? You know, can anybody outcook the, the mosque? But that was a trial for me, and it, it, and it was a struggle. And I, I think a lot that he never let my heart go bitter with, with the believers. Even the ones I was classing with, right or wrong, whether I was wrong or they was wrong, it didn't make no difference. I never grew bitter and started having a, a foul attitude and spirit toward no believer. And I thought I was looking at myself like, how can I improve? How can I do better? You know? Crazy. It's a lot of beautiful, sir. Thank you. And you were healing a lot of people with your testimony. And thank you all for watching the People's Podcast. Um, Sister Ariane says, all oh, praise be to Allah, brother. Ronald says, brother took a group of brothers to see um, his father in the hospital and the laborers said he was moving ahead of the leadership. Shaking my brother was always been a brother. Uh, first, never no big eyes and little news. Thank you, sir, for uh, looking out for brother Ronald and his- uh, Yeah, that's my brother there. I remember that. <laughs> oh, praise be to Allah. Ronald, if I was there, I would move to go see your dad too. <laughs> uh, my next question is, um, what has been your greatest joy? Man, being a being a Muslim, like real talk, like 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 really, you know, some of my greatest joy has been being able to stand on, you know. I so right now when I speak, you know, sometimes I go into an audience that's like predominantly Caucasian, you know, and being able to have what the minister called that testicular fortitude to be strong enough to go there and, and say the minister name and you know, the, not not cow down or punk out or battle out and you know, sometimes we go among other ethnic groups, we, we want to downplay, you know, what we believe. And yes. I don't overdo it. I, I don't, every, you know, everything I say, I don't, it, it ain't behind every sentence, the Amalaj Muhammad said, I'm in the park. I, I, don't, I don't do it like that, but I say what they say. And, 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 and people know what, where it come from. So one of my greatest joy was, was, was to see myself in situations where I knew, because um, I've had situations where um, I was doing a, a storytelling event and it, it was paid and it was at a Jewish theater here. And so when the people found out I was one of the premier uh, speakers of this event, they came to the organizers and they like, well, you know, you're Muslim and very kind of anti-Semitic and all that kind of stuff. So the sister came to me and she said, well, and the part of my story was to say, to mention the minister's name. That's, I was gonna say his name of, of, of um, the, the story that, that I was telling. So she said, well, and she was a Christian sister. She said, well, do you just wanna say the minister and not say his name? I'm like, sister, hell no. We saying, now I'm saying the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm going to say it 10 more times. Now I say, sister, I ain't spending your money. You know, you keep the money and all that. I don't care. And the sister was strong enough, fortunate Christian sister, she was strong enough to say, no, nah, he's going to be a part of it. We're going to go on with the production. And when we did it, probably, we did 14 different shows. It, it, it was a paid event. And it was probably 85% Caucasian. But they loved it. They loved it. And, and um, uh, that was good for me because I know I was in a situation where I could have said, I could have punked out for the money or whatever. And I'm like, man, take that money and that show and all that stuff and go about your business with that. Because I'm saying who, who the man who did it, Farrakhan, I mean, I'm saying his name, you know? So that was a, um, like a joy for me within myself. Nobody else knew how I felt, but I felt good within myself because I didn't behind the scenes without nobody looking, ain't nobody back there with me and there's money on the table. I felt good within myself knowing Damn it, I'm, I, I follow that man. Everybody know, I don't got no shame about that, you know? Praise be so I have just two more questions and thank you all for watching. Uh, my sister Mimi Miriam says respect. All praise be to Allah. I wanna also make sure, I got some new sponsorships when I was writing down. My father's book, A Soldier in the Movement of Christ is on abdulsharif.com. Thank you very much, dad, for your support. 
as well. And thank you all for the anonymous sponsors that I write down. Thank you, because everybody doesn't want to be mentioned. Thank you all. Our brother from Mississippi, thank you, sir. I truly appreciate that. Um, my next question is, uh, what advice would you give to the, the, the youth about keeping their faith? All these years, you know what I'm saying? And you, you know how to say 10 toes down. And you, when you say they pray, you're talking about in, in like the young believers? Yes, sir. Oh man, that's a big one, brother. Because when, when I see, I, I started coming as a, as a junior at FOI, right? Yes, sir. And even though I was buck wild in the streets, I, I was still coming to the mosque at, at 11 years old when I first went. And when I look back on it, brother, almost, man, it, it, I, I can count on one hand, I have fingers left over. The, the, the number of young people that I grew up with in the mosque, we played together and, you know, had fun, basketball or whatever, on the phone, talking. They know most of them are not studying the mosque right now. And mm -hmm. I think part of it is, from a parent perspective, part of it is, you know, um, we're not transparent and real enough with our children. You, you know, uh, we're not um, committed to our children. And, you know, I, I think one time I heard the minister t tell a story um, about when um, his children was younger, how he missed certain activities with them. And um, as, as he matured, he told the brothers, like, brother, spend time with our children, brother, you know, like, cause you don't know how that affect them. And that, when I heard that, that really affected me cause I was so gun ho and zealous with the teaching, final call and soldier and in the mosque, they're, they're so drilling and holding posts and all that, you know. But from the from the young person's um, perspective, I, I think what I would tell young people, you know, what kept me is like um, being true to myself and not being judgmental. You know, and when I say true to myself, I never was the front type, man. Here, yeah, I, I just never even, you know, it, it was crazy. When I came out, to, I was fornicating when I came out, right? And so I was there for I came out to the mosque though. So, you know, you, you know, you know, you get time for that in, yes, sir. in our nation. So when she told me she was pregnant after the Million Man March, you know, the Million Man March, baby, I remember going to the captain. I said, hey, brother, you know, I got a sister pregnant. He's like, huh? Like, you finna tell me that? <laughs> like, you know, people don't say something like that, you know? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm letting you know, because I ain't finna be, I ain't finna be sneaking, I ain't finna do none of that, bro. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and I remember, you know, I met with the laborers, and it was the, the, all the, the principal laborers and the sister secretary, she say, brother, do you love her? I say, well, nah. I said, I've been out 40 some days. I love her. I don't know about that. I mean, she's she yeah, cute, she's fine little sister. I can't say I really love her, to be to be true, you know, but but then, but they say, well, brother, you know, she's pregnant. And, and the best thing to do is, you know, to marry her, or we're gonna give you time out, you know. And that advice on the on the one end was good, but for me, on, on another end, it wasn't so good because, man, I didn't know how to pay bills at that time. I didn't know how to take care. I didn't know nothing, brother. I didn't know how to. Man, I remember when I got my first check and everything went to light bill, gal. I'm gonna went crazy. I'm like, man, what the hell? I've been working 42 weeks and I ain't got no money left. I just couldn't phantom that, you know, because I, I went, I was still in high school when I went to prison, you know. And um, so being true to yourself, you know, all the time, you know, being true to yourself and not just mental, you know, not really judging. Because it's easy, you know, to judge your parents and they doing this, they doing that. Sometimes they be mean and whatever, they be strict, or whatever, you know. Um, but just be true to yourself and, 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 and pace yourself too. You know, um, uh, I had my children to the extreme at the time. When I had a single dad, man, they were sleeping in the mosque, living in the mosque and everything. You know, they, they in the, because I'm, I'm the all night, you know, when the brothers get together, we get to talking, it'd be two o'clock in the morning, man. You know, and yeah. sometimes my children, truthfully, we haven't ate dinner. I'm, 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 on, I'm, on, I'm on my way home. I had to get them a burger from a 24 hour fast food joint. And, you know, I didn't try to just neglect them, but I was so into the cause. Until I learned and, and, and realized that my children are part of the cause too. Man. You're talking about the resurrection of the dead. My children are part of the resurrection of the dead and my family is a part of the resurrection of the dead. So I didn't separate the, what I call the cause from my children, you know? So, you know, children, pace yourself. And don't, if even your parents kind of crazy, pace yourself and, you know, do it along, you know. Yes, yes sir. sir. Beautiful. My siblings and I, you know, we want to thank your, sac your children and, and for their sacrifice as well, because, we know what it feels like to have a zealous parent, <laughs> zealous parent so we yeah. definitely understand. Uh, do you, are you ever going to write a book? Oh, uh, yes, I, yeah, actually I wrote several books. I wrote my first book in 2017. Um, it's called yeah. Straight Up, 17 Lessons on Living Authentically. And um, my wife and I, we just, and I, I wrote a few other books, but my wife and I, we just co-authored a book um, called Stillborn. Um, I had it around it somewhere. And um, so Stillborn, it's How a story. Stay? Huh? How do we get it? Still, oh, um, it's on, um, you can go to um, um, uh, Amazon. 
Yeah, so it's on Amazon. Um, you know, you can just type in Amazon, type in Ghazi Muhammad, and, and it's on that. So Stillborn is a, um, you know, my wife and I, when we got married last year, we come up on our one year anniversary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she got pregnant like a month later, you know, um, and, you know, we was excited and she wound up losing the baby. You know, the baby uh, died in, in uh, October. Um, and she was like, like 20 some weeks. So she had to deliver the baby stillborn, you know, and the baby name would have been Kayani. So the idea behind stillborn is that our daughter died, but something was stillborn, an ideal and a vision and a mission, because right. we took that and, and we, we co-authored a book and then we started a foundation, the Kayani Foundation in, in, in honor of our daughter that's impacting uh, at-risk youth. And doing when the coronavirus kicked off, you know, we was able to get one of the black charter schools here who, when all the children was going into um, homeschooling, they had to do this class online. Mm-hmm. Some of the schools don't have computers. So from our foundation, we was able to purchase 10 computers and donate it to one of the black charter schools here. And uh, so something was still born, you know, and, and, and that's something that we are passionate. And so in, in, in my mind, you know, we able to, to take all tragedy, all pain and turn it into something. So a part of my philosophy in life is this right here, that every experience that we have, Brother Joshua, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, every experience carries a lesson. Yes, and sir. it's the lesson that catapults us to the next level. And we, we was taught that experience is the best teacher, but sometimes I challenge proverbial wisdom. And because I know people who go through the same experience over and over and they ain't learned nothing, they die going through the same experience, right? Yes. But I believe that in every experience, there's a lesson. And that if you get that lesson, that lesson will catapult your life to a new level. And the example I like to use is just because I experienced the kindergarten. I went to recess with my friends. I went on field trips. I went to lunch. I went to the gym, music class, art class, did my math and my homework. Just because I experienced that don't mean I'm going to the first grade. I got to get the lessons of the kindergarten in order to go to the first grade. And that's just how life is. Many of us, we go through experiences even if they bad experiences, I don't have a bad experience. I don't care how rough it is, how painful it is. To me, it ain't bad because I'm gonna start looking for the, the hand of the God and, and looking for the lessons that's gonna help um, better my life and take my life to another level. Beautiful, praise be to Allah. My sister Naima says, all praise be to Allah. My sister Miriam says, that's a beautiful way to honor her spirit. May Allah continue to bless you and your wife. Praise be to Thank Allah. Thank you. Yes, sir. My next question is, what would you like your legacy to be, Brother Gazi? Man, just um, a sincere brother, you know, to be honest, just just somebody who's sincere. Um, when I wrote the book straight up, I would ask brothers like, man, you know, how would y'all characterize me? People I knew, they say, man, you keep it 100, you know, you know, because I, I was in the ministry for many years in, in, in the nation. And even on the roster, my, I, I might say some stuff, they, they got to check me like, brother, they got to call me in the back, say, you can't say that kind of stuff from the roster. <laughs> they ain't telling them what I'm going to say across that roster, but it's going to come from the heart. Whatever I say, it's going to be from the heart. And if I'm wrong, I stand to be corrected. And I humble myself and be like, oh, okay, oh, my, 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 you know, my bad. But <laughs> being, um, you know, just being a, a straight up brother and a servant. And, you know, my most consistent and sincere prayer to Allah, Master Muhammad is to make me a sincere helper of the minister. You know, uh, I, I echo that sentiment of my mother, the man who changed my life around, who helped me, I mean, who impacted me so much. I've, I've been blessed to be in his presence several times in my life and to meet him and, you know, um, I just pray a lot, bless me to be a sincere helper uh, of that man right there. And everything that I say and do and to, to help lead towards the, the mission that the Ambalaj Muhammad was given by Master Muhammad. And now the minister picked that man up and all of us picked that man up just to be one that contribute, to add my little brick. Might not be a big brick, you know, it might be a corner of the mortar on the brick. But if I can put that little mortar right there, that's, that's mine. You know, I put that right there to help get it together. I'm satisfied with that. Praise be to Allah. Okay, and thank you all for watching. Thank you for your comments. And once again, Brother Ghazi, thank you for your uh, honesty, your transparency, and your powerful testimony. Man, uh, thank you, brother. And I, was, I just want to say, man, I appreciate you, but you know, I've been watching you over, over the last couple of years, and I really enjoy, um, you know, when, I, when I'm when i able to catch your, um, your shows, I really enjoy it. And uh, I seen you had my brother Joshua Farrakhan on several weeks. Man, I enjoyed that, man. He just straight, you know, my kind of brother, just straight to the point. I just enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed that. But I, I've heard many of your guests and, you know, thank you for your work, brother. And I pray a lot, bless your work and efforts to soar to the highest heights. And your father, let me just say something about your father. Man, when I came out, your father was supreme, man, you know. So that discipline, boy, I remember, man, hey, man, I just loved it. And 
I, I love his energy and his spirit. And I, I really learned a lot when I came home. Uh, it, it was a blessing to come home to be up under that kind of structure. And I, I was in the central region, St. Louis. So, you know, we got a lot of chance to work with Chicago. And he was down in, in St. Louis, came to a few lectures. And, you know, he really impacted my life in a real, real way, you know. So I thank a lot for your father, too. Praise be to God. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. I look forward to, um, you know, my brother is in Phoenix quite a bit and now Brother Ronald. So I'll see you soon, inshallah. And um, yes, sir. I look forward to having a conversation in there. I want to read some of your books as well. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, you, big brother. Love you, man. Love you more, bro. Guys, I, I got I to gotta get you to come back so you can talk about your, you know, specifics about your books and things like that. Okay. Yes, sir. No problem. Yes, sir. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.